The tracheobronchial tree undergoes 23 orders of branching between the trachea and the alveolar sacs. The more proximal um, airway branches um, contain tr uh, cartilage within their walls, and we call these airways bronchi. Uh, the more peripheral um, airways don't have cartilage in their wall, and uh, we call these airways bronchioles. Um, something interesting happens to the more peripheral bronchioles once you've reached around 17 orders of branching from the trachea. Uh, the bronchioles start um, having these little patches of alveoli um, sporadically along their walls um, that allow some degree of uh, gas exchange before you've even reached the alveolar ducts and the alveolar sacs. Um, these bronchioles we refer to as respiratory bronchioles. Um, when we look at the um, kind of the uh, whole kind of anatomy of the trachea bronchial tree from um, upstream to downstream or central to peripheral, um, folks often divide the um, airways into a more proximal conducting zone and a more um, peripheral respiratory zone. Uh, the respiratory zone are the airways uh, in which some degree of gas exchange occurs, uh, whereas the conducting zone um, um, are just airways uh, where no gas exchange across, occurs across the wall, and those airways are purely um, there just to allow gas uh, movement back and forth. The conducting zone can be further broken down between large airways and small airways. Um, from the large airways, we're generally referring to the trachea and bronchi. Um, with respect to small airways, we're, just, we're usually referring to the bronchioles that are proximal to those respiratory bronchioles. Um, one last thing to throw out there, you will see this term terminal bronchial. Uh, those terminal bronchioles are the very, very most distal um, uh, non-respiratory um, bronchioles. They're usually around 16th order of branching off the trachea. For the purposes of this talk, um, we're going to be focusing mostly on the large airways. Um, so we'll spend a bit of time discussing tracheal disorders and then a little bit of time describing uh, one um, may, um, primary uh, bronchial uh, disorder, and that's going to be bronchiectasis. But let's talk about tracheal disorders. Um, when we look at uh, tracheal disorders, uh, we can fundamentally divide them into two major groups um, from a, both a kind of a, a conceptual standpoint and also a diagnostic standpoint when we're interpreting uh, medical imaging. Um, either we can uh, divide tracheal disorders into focal disorders involving um, a focal segment of the trachea uh, versus diffuse tracheal disorders, which involve the entire trachea. Um, focal uh, tracheal disorders, um, you know, when we encounter them, I usually think of two main categories, uh, post-intubation strictures and tracheal tumors. Now, there are going to be some tracheal tumors that are benign and then some that are, unfortunately, malignant. Now, one thing I didn't put on this chart, which, you know, certainly I think requires at least one slide, is the most common uh, tracheal opacity you're going to encounter on imaging, which is just you know, a mucus glob. It happens all the time. And oftentimes we can recognize these um, mucus um, globs relatively prospectively, if you will, um, because we might, if we look carefully enough, see tiny air bubbles inside this endotracheal opacity. Um, or sometimes uh, the morphology may be clearly stringy, especially if you look at it perhaps on a sagittal or coronal plane if it's not obvious on an axial CT. Um, other times, uh, you know, a very, very unusual complex shape that's not typical for like a polyp or a growth um, may clue us in that we're looking at a mucus glob. And sometimes, um, you know, an element of uh, comparison uh, to a different time point uh, can help us too. Um, either uh, we might have had a chest CT just a few days or weeks ago where nothing was there and now we see it today, um, suggesting it's mucus because, you know, uh, most growths wouldn't happen that quickly. Or um, alternatively, it could be a situation where we see something and it goes away when we repeat the, the CT um, in the short uh, term interval. And it, that would also kind of clue us in that we're looking at a mucus glob. But um, what we're gonna focus mostly on are our true um, focal uh, tracheal disorders for this second of the talk, um, starting with post intubation strictures. Um, it's really important to think about these uh, because not only are they common, but they're often overlooked when people are scrolling through an axial CT deck. Um, the causes of uh, post-intubation stricture are, are either 
um, an endotracheal intubation in the past or a patient who's had a tracheostomy. Um, Post-intubation um, strictures uh, usually occur at the thoracic inlet. The thoracic inlet, uh, if you remember, is basically the level uh, that's uh, where the first ribs usually are. Um, so that's the segment of trachea I'm going to be kind of focusing more attention to. Post-intubation strictures tend to be pretty short, um, usually less than two centimeters in length. And if you look at them on, a, say, a coronal or a, maybe a sagittal plane, um, the, the stricture is relatively symmetric, uh, kind of looks like an hourglass. And um, usually the wall of the trachea is normal in thickness. Um, we can sometimes um, um, have a, a sense of whether the post-intubation stricture was due to an ET tube or tracheostomy um, by the morphology of the stricture in um, axial cross-section. Uh, the ones that are more kind of concentrically or circumferentially uh, narrowed uh, tend to be post endotracheal intubation strictures, whereas the ones that are more triangular or A-shaped um, um, tend to be uh, post-tracheostomy strictures. Now, the other focal tracheal abnormality that we have to be more cautious about, or probably always cautious about, um, are tracheal tumors. And um, although there's, there's lots of different tracheal tumors um, out there, um, the four most common ones are the ones that we'll probably want you to remember um, on this rotation. Um, those are uh, papillomas, squamous cell carcinomas, adenoid cystic carcinomas, and mucoepidermoid carcinomas. Um, as you can see from this pie chart, um, unfortunately, the majority of true tracheal tumors are malignant, um, and only 20% uh, are, are, are benign. Uh, the breakdown of these um, malignant um, tracheal tumors looks like this. So you can see that uh, the lion's share of malignant tracheal tumors are going to be squamous cell carcinomas and adenoid cystic carcinomas. Um, it may be tough to commit these four um, tracheal tumors to memory. And so, you know, kind of a, a memorization aid, if you will, that I use is I think about the basic anatomy of the trachea, um, the basic anatomy of the trachea and cross-section. Um, I know about the inner lining of the trachea, something called the mucosa. And immediately deep to the mucosa is another lining we call the submucosa. And um, the submucosa is there to basically support the mucosa. And one of the most important, I think, um, you know, uh, components of the submucosa are these mucus glands, which secrete the mucus and fluid that keep the mucosa moist. Um, and then if you move most peripherally, you have these cartilage rings uh, most of the way around, except for immediately posterior, where we have the um, tracheolus muscle. Um, and when I, I think about the anatomy and think about uh, what are the um, kind of constituents of this anatomy that are most likely to give rise to a tracheal tumor? And those happen to be the mucosa and the mucus glands um, in the submucosa. The mucosa uh, are going to be uh, uh, basically the layer from which papillomas and squamous cell carcinomas are derived, uh, whereas adroid cystic carcinomas and mucoepidermoid carcinomas are derived from the mucus glands. And so if I can remember this basic anatomy, um, it gives me a fighting chance to remember what the four top uh, tracheal tumors are. Uh, we'll start with the benign one on this list, papillomas, um, um, the most common benign tracheal tumor. Uh, papillomas can sometimes occur um, solitary, meaning like maybe just one in the trachea, but actually more often when they do occur, um, they occur uh, in multiples. Um, and uh, a common um, diagnosis we may encounter, uh, especially in a board setting, is um, a situation where uh, multiple papillomas are growing throughout the trachea and sometimes into the more peripheral airways too. Uh, well, that uh, disorder is referred to as laryngeotracheal papillomatosis. Um, what's interesting about this uh, disorder is uh, as you get these papillomas not only in the trachea but the more peripheral airway, um, sometimes these papillomas may occlude um, the airway. And as we occlude the airway, we may create, say, obstructive atelectasis, especially if it's, say, in a lobar airway. Um, we could also, um, you know, these, these obstructions can predispose to post-obstructive pneumonias downstream from the obstruction points. Um, 
And um, sometimes, um, some nice ex imaging examples, by the way, of papillomatosis here, um, you can have a check valve kind of a mechanism occur where um, the papilloma uh, creates basically a situation where air can get, um, you know, peripheral, but during inspiration, but have a hard time leaving. And then you end up creating these large kind of um, pneumatoceles um, um, within the lung peripheral to the um, papilloma that's, that's a, um, occluding an airway. Um, so uh, in many ways, it uh, kind of uh, resembles the pathophysiology of uh, acquired cystic lung disease. So that's stroke of papillomas. Um, as I mentioned, it's the most common uh, benign tumor. There are other ones, but they're very, very rare. So, um, you know, papillomas are going to be the kind of benign tumor you want to kind of commit to memory first. Um, the most common malignant um, tracheal tumor um, are squamous cell carcinomas, um, generally associated with a history of smoking. Um, from a morphologic standpoint on CT imaging, um, when we encounter these, they usually are a, a kind of a sessile polyp within the, um, the tracheal lumen. Um, but sometimes we can give other morphologies. So um, maybe 1 in 10 may present more as kind of a circumferential um, growth as opposed to just a kind of a eccentric polyp. Um, and um, uh, not a small number do, um, you know, invade into the mediastinum surrounding the trachea um, at the time of discovery. Um, in addition to that, um, sometimes we may, we may encounter um, uh, nodal metastases as well. Um, as you remember from the pie chart um, a few slides ago, adenoid cystic carcinomas are also a common uh, tracheal malignant uh, tumor, the second most common uh, uh, tumor. Uh, adenoid cystic carcinomas um, don't, um, um, are not associated with smoking, um, tend to grow a little bit uh, more indolently than the squamous cell carcinomas do. Um, and occasionally, um, these um, we'll, we'll see examples where adenoid cystic carcinomas tend to grow longitudinally, um, basically cranial caudally along the length of the trachea. Um, in this particular example that I've kind of uh, picked from my uh, teaching file, um, this one happens to be a little bit more focal um, in its uh, morphology. Mucal epidermoid carcinomas uh, were the fourth uh, kind of tracheal tumor. Uh, we wanted you to kind of remember uh, this one malignant as well, but uh, considerably uh, much more uncommon uh, than squamous cell carcinomas and adenoid cystic carcinomas in the trachea. So that's a nice overview hopefully, of, um, you know, focal tracheal disorders that uh, you might encounter and the kind of differential diagnosis you want to think about most of the time. When we look at um, uh, disorders of the trachea that are diffuse, uh, that uh, involve the entire trachea, uh, we can divide these uh, into ones that are, uh, that do not uh, cause or are not associated with uh, tracheal wall thickening and ones that are associated with tracheal wall thickening. The three most common disorders to kind of think about um, that are diffuse in their kind of distribution in the trachea when they happen, but are not associated with trachea wall thickening are saber tooth trachea and tracheomalacia and tracheobronchomegaly. Uh, the first two are very common. So you'll usually see multiple examples uh, any given day you're, you're reading out. Whereas uh, tracheomegaly um, is much, much, much more uncommon. Um, saber chief trachea basically um, uh, has a morphology where the trachea's uh, transverse diameter uh, is kind of narrows, decreases, while the AP um, diameter increases. So instead of a relatively uh, round cross section, the cross section becomes a lot more kind of a like a thin oval, if you will. And it's supposed to remind us of the uh, sheath that a sword or a saber would fit into. It's technically defined as a situation where the cross-sectional diameter of the trachea is such that the transverse diameter is at least 50% or less um, smaller than the AP diameter. Um, one uh, important point to point out is that um, the, this morphology by itself doesn't have a clinical significance, but um, has a very strong association with COPD. So if you see saber sheath trachea, um, it's very, very likely your patient has COPD.
Tracheal ventilation was the other uh, common uh, diffuse tracheal disorder uh, not, um, that is not associated with uh, tracheal wall thickening. Uh, tracheal ventilation is just a situation where uh, the trachea collapses um, on expiratory imaging or collapses in such a way or collapses at least 50% of the way in the AP diameter. Um, and um, we can recognize this really nicely on inspiratory expiratory um, CT sometimes, um, like in this particular example. The final um, diffuse tracheal disorder uh, with no association with tracheal wall thickening is a congenital disorder um, uh, known as tracheal bronchomegaly or, or by its um, eponym, uh, Munier Kuhn. Uh, with uh, tracheal bronchomegaly, the diameter of the trachea enlarges in both the transverse and the AP uh, direction, so in all, all directions. And oftentimes the morphology uh, of the trachea, really you can, the, the kind of the anterior trachea rings are, are kind of accentuated as the airway in between the rings kind of bulges out. So you kind of see this classic corrugated appearance of the anterior trachea wall, especially on a, a sagittal CT or, or perhaps a lateral chest X-ray. Um, trachea bronchomegaly is also um, often associated with um, a central bronchial dilation as well. Uh, because these airways are so large, um, they kind of become more flabby. And so uh, you'll often see um, dynamic collapse of the airways um, on expiratory versus inspiratory um, imaging, kind of like what you would see with uh, trachea malacia. We look at um, diffuse uh, tracheal disorders that are associated wall, uh, with wall thickening. Uh, we can um, split those into two groups, both conceptually and also uh, for purposes of diagnosis when um, we're reading chest CT. Um, basically, there are two disorders that um, spear the posterior membrane uh, when they thicken the wall of the trachea diffusely. Those are um, relapsing polychondritis, pretty common, and a disease called tracheal bronchopathia osteochondroblastica, or TBPO, a very rare disease, um, but does often show up uh, um, in a kind of a boards or a quiz setting. Uh, then we have um, disorders that thicken the entire um, tr um, tracheal wall 360, circumferentially, no sparing of the posterior membrane. And in those um, kind of uh, kind of group, in that group, um, we'll um, want you to remember um, GPA, or what we used to call Wegener's amyloid um, infection and sarcoidosis. But let's uh, focus on the um, diffuse tracheal disorders um, that involve um, you know, that are associated with wall thickening, but spare the posterior um, tracheal wall. Um, starting with relapsing polychondritis, which also happens to be the most common cause of diffuse um, tracheal wall thickening. Um, oftentimes, um, some element of um, calcification can occur within the, um, the thickened areas of the trachea. Um, the hallmark of relapsing poly, uh, polychondritis, as you can see in this uh, images here is wall thickening of the entire trachea that spares the posterior wall. Um, and the posterior wall is just be normally normal thickness, very, very thin. Um, uh, Relapse in polychondritis often uh, may manifest in other places. Um, so these patients may not only have um, tracheal disorder, but perhaps a neck, uh, sorry, an ear or, or a nose um, disorder. The other diagnosis we wanted to put on your list um, in terms of um, diffuse tracheal disorders uh, with uh, wall thickening that spares the posterior tracheal wall is this entity called TBPO. Um, it's a very uncommon entity, um, but what happens to this entity is um, you kind of grow, you know, hundreds, of, like maybe even thousands of little um, uh, nodular opacities along the um, tracheal wall. Um, that grow in such a way that does, however, spear the posterior membrane. Um, these little nodular opacities often um, are calcified, or at least partially calcified. And so you have this kind of look that you see on, on this image here. Um, and this image here, uh, the corresponding sagittal image. Um, this is a really kind of a cool um, uh, image from a CT um, um, 
uh, chest um, central airway protocol that we did. And we're basically just looking down the lumen of the trachea um, from within inside the trachea. And you can probably see that the wall of that, this trachea looks very, very lumpy bumpy. Um, these are all the little nodular passages that, that are causing the wall to effectively look thickened or be, be thickened. Um, but what's interesting is along the posterior um, um, wall, uh, where we've drawn the yellow arrows here, you can see how smooth that is because this process is sparing that posterior tracheal wall. Um, this is the corresponding um, um, bronchoscopy image of that trachea. And you can see along the kind of the, I'd say it's like the six to the maybe 830 position of this image, um, you can see how that wall of the trachea looks very, very smooth, but everywhere else around it, we have these nodular opacities. Um, that are causing that trachea to look um, abnormally thickened. Um, when we talk about um, um, diffuse tracheal disorders um, that cause wall thickening, but in a way that doesn't spare um, the posterior wall, namely it involves all 360 degrees of the trachea, uh, one of the things we always have to think about is GPA, uh, or what we used to refer to as Wegner's. Um, when this happens, it tends to be in a more advanced um, case of Wegner's, so usually not on initial presentation. And obviously in these kind of patients, um, it's important to look for other signs of uh, GPA within the, um, the CT. Um, amyloid um, is another disorder um, to think about uh, when we encounter um, diffuse tracheal wall thickening that involves all 360 degrees of the tracheal wall. Um, Amyloidosis is this um, abnormality of protein deposition throughout the body, and it has many different forms that it could manifest in on a chest CT, and this is just one of them. Um, um, there's other two disorders that um, we'll kind of want you to think about. Um, one is um, um, tracheal disorder, that's an, I'm sorry, a tracheal infection, uh, which can also cause um, diffuse tracheal wall thickening that doesn't spear the posterior membrane. Um, but in actuality, these tend to be relatively uncommon cases. Um, you know, we'll discuss uh, disorders like rhinoscleroma, uh, where the etiology is um, uh, basically granulomas infection. Um, and then we'll uh, occasionally um, uh, encounter perhaps cases of tuberculosis or endemic fungal infection that involve the, uh, the trachea. But these are all, um, I believe, pretty uncommon um, uh, situations you're going to encounter. And lastly, um, sarcoid's been known to um, uh, also result in diffuse concentric trachea wall thickening, but cases are, tend to be very, very few. And so I mean, if you do a literature search, uh, you're going to find um, very, very few examples of this actually reported, but it's something that uh, we do think about from time to time. So um, this is kind of the, um, the summary of um, tracheal disorders that we want you to think about. Um, and we've kind of broken it down, uh, you know, using these Venn diagrams here, um, not only to help, uh, you, know, um, um, you know, lend some structure um, um, conceptually, um, but also to help with basically how to approach the diagnosis. So when you see something that's not quite right with the trachea, ask yourself, is it focal or diffuse? And if it's focal, um, well, I guess, is, is it, you know, are you looking at a mucus glob or a true issue like a post inhibition structure or a tumor? On the other hand, if it's diffuse, uh, how does the wall look? If, it's, if the wall is unthickened, uh, normal thickness, um, you should be able to easily, pretty easily um, able to distinguish between the three disorders we've listed. Uh, on the other hand, if the wall is thickened, um, in a, um, you're going to then kind of perhaps look at the posterior membrane and see if that's involved. And if it is or isn't, um, you'll be able to narrow down your differential further. Okay, that leads us to the second part of this talk. Um, and um, we're gonna be discussing uh, bronchial disorders, um, in particular, bronchiectasis. Um, for this um, part of the talk, um, I'd like to start with um, an analogy. Um, to try to, you know, probably uh, simplify our, our appreciation and understanding of bronchiectasis. Um, if you ever looked at the back of a car, perhaps a minivan, um, it's un 
not uncommon to see these cargo nuts, um, you know, um, you know, in the back of these, um, you know, tr their trunks and stuff like this. And I'd like you to focus on just one of the holes within this cargo nut, that one, and I'll blow it up for you in size. And um, I want to ask you to conduct a thought experiment. Um, so, you know, this cargo nut's there, so things like golf balls or other objects don't fall out. And um, think about uh, under what conditions could that hole become big enough such that the ball may actually, the golf ball may be able to fall out. And there's really three reasons why any of these holes in this cargo nut could be abnormally enlarged. The first reason might be that uh, for whatever reason, there's an increased amount uh, of tension all around that particular area, more than normal. Um, if that were to happen, you might pull that uh, one of those you know holes in the net open um, so wide that um, big enough for the ball to um, fall through. Um, the second um, possible um, um, explanation for um, why uh, this hole may get uh, larger than usual may be because there's been a lot of wear and tear on this section of the net. And so although the tension in that area is normal, um, because those little threads are a lot, lot thinner um, than they used to be, um, that, that hole that, um, in that part of the net can be pulled open a little bit wider and so wide that your golf ball is going to fall through. Um, and the third reason might be just a case of manufacturing error, where they just unfortunately made a cargo net with holes that were just too big. So if I ask myself, uh, why may any particular hole in a cargo net um, be larger than it should be? Um, the three reasons basically are there's uh, you know more tension or traction around that area than usual. Uh, there's more wear and tear on the material itself, or there's basically been a manufacturing error. When I ask myself, why does a bronchus enlarge, um, especially why would bronchiectasis happen, the um, same exact three causes um, are my answer. So, um, you know, one reason bronchiectasis happens is because um, there's increased traction um, all around the bronchi, um, and that traction pulls that bronchus open. And most often, um, what's the cause of attraction? The cause is some sort of fibrosis of the lung parenchyma in which this bronchus um, is kind of living. And that fibrosis uh, most often uh, derives from ILD, uh, radiation fibrosis, or sarcoidosis. Um, other reasons why um, bronchiectasis could happen uh, may involve just chronic wear and tear that um, uh, eats away, if you will, at the elastic um, tissue within the wall of the bronchus. Uh, this wear and tear is usually um, a result of some prolonged chronic inflammatory process, um, some non-infectious and some infectious. Examples of non-infectious inflammatory processes that could result in a lot of wear and tear um, on the wall of the bronchus and its elastic tissues are chronic aspiration, um, just chronic exposure of um, basically these walls to acid, or um, a more enzymatic cause, um, um, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, the infectious inflammatory kind of causes uh, that would result in wear and tear um, on the, um, the wall of the bronchus um, um, maybe um, in situations where either um, some sort of bug is involved that the immune system just has a really hard time killing, um, in which case the you know it's able to cause a chronic um, infectious inflammatory state, or a situation where maybe the microbe is not horribly abnormal, but we're talking about um, some area where secretions are just stagnating. And as you all remember, um, stagnant fluid collections tend to be great um, um, uh, media for infection to brew. Um, but let's be a little bit more specific. Um, when we talk about microbes that are hard to eliminate, what are we referring to? Um, generally, um, bugs like uh, mycobacterial organisms um, are things we're going to think about. So um, um, these, uh, these organisms tend to be very difficult 
uh, for the immune system to kill. This is why therapies tend to be uh, multi-drug and over multiple months. Um, and sometimes um, the chronic infection, I guess, uh, may not necessarily be due to the bug being hard to kill, but because the immune system is um, failing in some way to handle a normal bug. And so CVID, common variable immunodeficiency, is something else you know that could explain um, prolonged inf um, infection leading to inflammation that causes a lot of wear and tear. We're talking about uh, stagnant secretions, uh, basically referring to areas of uh, chronic mucus plugging. A chronic mucus plugging can predispose to inflammation that leads to bronchiectasis. And if we ask yourself, why um, would you encounter chronic mucus plugging in an otherwise originally normal airway? Um, usually it could be because the secretions are just too thick. So the, the um, you know, all those cilia that are kind of clearing things up, they're working and, you know, the pathway's open to get stuff out, but it, the, the secretions are just too darn thick. Um, another reason to have chronic mucus plugging is maybe you have some sort of, um, central airway obstruction so that even though the secretions are thin and the cilia are working to propel things upstream, um, they can't get out because there's a blockage. And then finally, um, rarely maybe it's the, the ciliary um, escalator that's, that's not working. So the secretions are thin, the exit's open, but we're just not propelling things um, out. And so uh, two top reasons why you may encounter just really, really thick secretions within the airways um, are CF and ABPA. Um, in those conditions, um, the mucus tends to be really, really thick, hard to clear, and could be uh, something that sets up for um, uh, a higher risk of infection. Um, any cause of a central airway occlusion um, could um, also be uh, predisposed to chronic mucus plugging. And then under clearance mechanism broken, um, what I want you to think about is uh, cartagenous or dysmodal cilia syndrome. Um, finally, uh, manufacturing error. Um, pretty, pretty uncommon um, as a cause of bronchiectasis. Um, so the one thing I'm going to throw out there is a pretty rare syndrome called Williams-Campbell. Um, it's associated with bronchiectasis. So if I can have a way of thinking about how bronchiectasis actually happens, um, it really, really helps me remind myself what the differential diagnosis of possibilities is for, is for bronchiectasis. Uh, and primarily, I'm focused on columns one and two here, just because Williams-Campbell is so incredibly rare. So when I see bronchiectasis, sometimes it's because um, there's scarring in the lung around it, ILD, from, from ILD, from radiation therapy, from sarcoid. Um, we'll often use terms like traction bronchiectasis or cicatricial bronchiectasis when describing these cases. Um, if it's not this situation, um, more often than not, it's a chronic inflammatory situation that's at play. Am I dealing with a patient who's a chronic aspirator? Or am I dealing with a situation where there's some sort of chronic infection element at play? Um, MAI is a, a nice example of this. Uh, common variable immunodeficiency is another good, good example, though much less common. And then uh, think about um, all the different reasons why you could have chronic mucus plugging. Um, and then uh, you'll probably have uh, a pretty good shot at identifying the cause of the bronchiectasis you're looking at on that particular case. Now, when we're recognizing or trying to identify bronchiectasis on a chest CT, um, it's very common to basically use the signet ring sign to decide if you want to be, if you think uh, you're looking at a case of bronchiectasis. Basically, that's just referring to a situation where the diameter of the bronchus on the chest CT looks like it's larger than the pulmonary artery with which it um, parallels. Um, but there are some other signs to think about. Um, we know that um, airways taper distally as you move from central to peripheral. And so if you're able to see an airway and the airway isn't tapering, it's looking like it's uh, the same diameter as you move central to peripheral or sometimes even larger, um, that might be a sign of bronchiectasis. Um, another sign of um, bronchiectasis or bronchiolectasis, um, that's dilation of the bronchioles, um, is when you see airways really close to the periphery of the lung. 
we really normally should not see um, airways visible on a chest CT within one to two centimeters of the, the, uh, the pleural surface. So when you do, um, it's most likely um, abnormally dilated. So this signet ring sign of comparing a pulmonary artery diameter to the adjacent um, um, airway diameter is not the only um, feature we look for uh, when trying to identify bronchiectasis on a CT. And then the last point is an important one. Um, not all airway dilation on a chest CT is necessarily bronchiectasis. Um, there's a lot of times where this bronchial dilation is actually reversible and not um, permanent or chronic. And so not every single case of bronchiectasis is, um, uh, sorry, not every single case of bronchial dilation is necessarily bronchiectasis. And so you'll often see um, folks who may uh, not choose to uh, call bronchiectasis um, on the first chest CT uh, when they observe um, this kind, these kind of findings. Um, they want to make sure that this is indeed a chronic process that's perhaps irreversible before they, they actually use the term bronchiectasis. Um, regarding the signet ring sign, um, we wanted to just kind of put out two caveats for you when you're reading a chest CT. Um, one caveat is um, sometimes we can undercall bronchiectasis. Um, how does this happen? This happens sometimes um, when there's an element of bronchial wall thickening at play, okay? So let's say we have, let's pretend this diagram here is the normal state and the bronchus is dilated, okay? Um, but if the bronchial wall itself thickens, um, the perceived inner airway diameter actually looks smaller on your chest CT. Uh, so if you're comparing the lumen to the pulmonary artery that's next to it, that ratio of airway to pulmonary artery diameter will actually uh, be uh, smaller or perhaps even normal and cause you to undercall bronchiectasis. Alternatively, there's a situation that you, do, you, know, you should be aware of that may cause you to overcall bronchiectasis. And that has, the fact, has to do with the fact that we're using the pulmonary artery um, as a reference. But in folks who are smokers, for example, sometimes um, those pulmonary arteries may vasoconstrict and be smaller than normal. Um, so if the uh, pulmonary artery shrinks, um, you may be in a situation where the airway hasn't changed and it's still normal, um, but the airway to artery diameter ratio now has gone up and may put you in a situation where you'll um, overcall bronchiectasis.